Okay, yeah, thank you, Chris. Thank you for uh, hosting and sponsoring this, these talks. Uh, so, in, and it, this is an engineer's perspective on the human condition, and, uh, and I'm an engineer. Uh, and, and, and the first part is the evolution of the universe as it was the last two years. I, I got a, a comment from uh, one of my students last year. I have about 400 students in the class that I teach. And he said, I had too many numbers, <laughs> but you know, I'm an engineer and engineers uh, live, live by numbers. So I, I, I don't know what to do about that. Um, but don't worry about all these numbers. The point is, is, is the sun is a, is a heat reservoir and empty space is a cold reservoir and you can see the difference in temperature. And so that means that the earth is a, is, as a system is a dissipative heat engine. And in fact, all the sun, sun's energy runs all the systems of the earth. And, and we'll actually see that in, in the next talk when we talk about the earth. Um, the, but that means, by the way, that the human economy is a dissipative heat engine since it's just a subset of the, of the uh, earth system. And that causes problems for us because um, modern economic theory doesn't understand thermodynamics. And we'll talk about that in part four. Now, the entire history of the evolution of our environment involves the evolution of the universe. That's this part. And then part two is the evolution of Earth. Uh, then civilization, when we get closer to, to, to the current modern times. And then we have to focus on our future. And I, and I, I, I divided this into two lectures, the um, evolution of possible futures with respect to economics and the evolution of possible futures with respect to energy. And that will be made clear by the time we get here. There are two uh, really e excellent books, Charles Langmuir and Wally Brokers, How to Build a Habitable Planet, and also uh, Paolo Saracino's uh, Beyond the Stars. And th they're, they're like the model for, for how I, I think we should consider our environment. They both start with the Big Bang and, and move forward and, and get to the, you know, the current situation today in terms of climate change and so forth. And they're very good reads. So Roger Penrose, a uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist, uh, in, his, uh, in his major text, Road to Reality, wrote, uh, we need to address the question of separating truth from false before we can adequately attempt to apply such understanding to separate good from bad. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I take this to read that if, if uh, and from his perspective, if, if you don't know the difference between true and false, you really can't develop good moral judgment. And uh, and I happen to agree with him. And I and I, but I don't think uh, if you can that it's it's a it's a it's a necessary and sufficient condition. I think it's necessary. I think uh, there's another condition you need to want to be moral. But the point is 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 is. You can want to be moral, and um, uh, and 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 if you can't tell the difference between true and false, you're going you're going to fall short. You know, it's not enough just that, to have that desire. Uh, so it's it's important to accumulate as much knowledge as we can, and also the another reason I go all the way back to the Big Bang, of course, is to develop develop. Um, a sense of curiosity because it's really exciting stuff that's going on in the world of science. So uh, following um, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, this is the scope of human knowledge. Uh, interesting side note, Dennis Diderot in 1745 published the first encyclopedia. He, he edited it for uh, about approximately 30 years. And he got, he had contacts all over uh, academic uh, Europe, and he was able to, to get a lot of uh, experts to write on different topics. And, uh, and it was 17 volumes. And at the time, you could think of 17 volumes as, as be, being big enough to capture, it in, in, in some sense, everything we know. And of course, you can't do that today. Uh, but, but, um, but, but, the, but, the, uh, but the internet does, <laughs> so you can find anything you want. But anyway, following Donald Rumsfeld, there are known knowns, and, and one of those is the periodic table of elements. Obviously, that's true. We, we, when we, no matter how far into space we look with our telescope or telescopes or our best microscopes, we see the periodic table of elements. We see those elements. We don't see any others. And, uh, and we see the elements in combination 
with with other elements in in, uh, in predictable patterns of molecules. Uh, so there are known unknowns, and and one of those is dark matter, and and dark matter is something we observe. It's a um, a phenomena, but we have no idea what causes it or what it's all about. And so it's an example of a known unknown. We also don't know how proteins fold, even though we know proteins themselves are known knowns. Uh, then Romsell call, talks about unknown unknowns, and that's all this gray area. I can't give you an example today of an unknown unknown, because if I could, it would move into the known unknown category. But if you go back to Diderot's time, uh, that he didn't know anything about MRI machines, X-rays, um, electricity wasn't known then. They didn't have a word for energy or entropy. And so there was enormous numbers of things that are today known knowns or known unknowns that, that, that were unknown unknowns in, in his day. And so there are things today that, that, uh, that we have no knowledge of, but, but in a hundred years from now, they'll, 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 they'll recognize that they, they discovered something or something like that. But what are, what are the problems are the things we know for sure, which just ain't so. Um, uh, thank you, Mark Twain. So the flat earth, uh, about 10% of Americans in a, in a, in a, believe that the earth is flat and another 10% aren't sure. <laughs> I don't know how you can be not sure. But, but so that's problematic. Um, that, that The people that believe that, um, I lost my, oh, there it is. I'm going to. I know I can pen, laser pointer. Okay, humans, uh, they, they don't believe in evolution. That's 30 to 40%, depending on the poll. Uh, there are 30 to 40% of American population believes the earth is less than 10,000 years old. And these are not simply not true. They're physically impossible. And then climate change denial is on the order of 50%, but probably even bigger than that because you know, hard denial is 50%, but there's an awful lot of soft denial. I think people that will say, yeah, yeah, climate change is, is, is real, but they don't really understand it. And, and I'm going to throw one out that's probably a little controversial. Neoliberal neoclassical economics is, is uh, and, um, and, and we'll get to this in part four. But, but I, I want to caution you if you, if you want to disagree with me, that's fine. Um, there are plenty of economists that, that, that criticize the, these neoliberal and neoclassical economics from within the economics discipline. You know, Yanis Varoufakis, uh, Steve Keen, Joe Stiglitz, and, and, and on and on and on. So it's not like um, that, that I'm, not, I'm not in good company amongst economists. But I look at it as a physicist. I'm really an engineer, but you know, phys my physical knowledge of physics, and it and it just doesn't hold water. It, it violates the laws of physics. And better, I think, a known known as ecological economics. In fact, there are a lot of physicists who are ecological economists, and 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 I myself consider myself an ecological economist, which I'm allowed to do because it's a very open uh, discipline. These guys don't talk to anybody. So uh, we'll get to that in, 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 the, in the fourth uh, edition. So this is our universe. This is our home. This is what it looks like. Uh, our our, our um, spiral galaxy looks something like this. Um, uh, of course, we can't look at ourselves, but uh, you know, some planet in this gal galaxy looking back towards us and their, with their version of the Hubble Space Telescope, we would see us in our local neighborhood. Um, I, I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, what people knew, uh, hunter gatherers, you know, so they had no microscopes or telescopes. So in fact, everybody before microscopes and telescopes, they only knew what they could see and observe and measure. Uh, so humans are on the order of a meter and they could, they could see much smaller things, but they couldn't see cells and they didn't know about cells. And, and, and the earth, they, they couldn't have an experience of, of the earth as a, as a sphere. So a flat earth made sense. And, uh, and it also made sense that to, to, because they could see the star, the sun and the stars and the moon and, and, and a few planets that to believe that everything revolved around the earth as a matter of practical practicality. 
and uh, and and so their knowledge was limited by by their their um, their tools. And uh, even before 1900, we we had telescopes and microscopes, some pretty good ones. We knew about cells by then, and we knew molecules. We didn't know about viruses, I don't think. And and lo looking out in this direction, um, we knew we knew the galaxy. We knew about one galaxy, the the um, the Milky Way galaxy, and we 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 our, our, we thought that was the entire universe. And it was until 1926 or so that we realized that some of the stars, if you will, were actually other galaxies like Andromeda and so forth. It took a long time to figure that out. But by 1900, we didn't know. Today, uh, we're, our, our knowledge is limited by our best telescopes, which include the James Webb and, the, um, and, um, and, and some of the space telescopes. And, uh, and, and we have lots of lots of really good telescopes in Chile and in the Andes and so forth. And, and we see all the way back to the microwave background, the cosmic microwave background. And so we, we can see our entire visible universe. And, and with, uh, with um, all kinds of electron microscopes and so forth, we can look back and we can actually, and, and, and especially with the Large Hadron Collider and other um, particle accelerators, we can actually see subatomic particles. So, so our, our knowledge has expanded with our capability to actually see it. Um, before I, I, I leave this subject, I'm going to talk about the Dunning-Kruger effect. And, 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 and another reason to motivate you, people, anybody, to, to, to learn as much as you can, even, even if you, you're not going to become an expert in a topic, um, you know, I think, think in terms of a, you know, a chess player who, who gets a 1200 rating knows full well that, um, you know, someone with a 2800 rating is far superior to him. He could see that, but he also knows that someone with a, with a 300 rating is not as good as him, you know, so he's got a good, a better, uh, view of, of, of the, the reality of the situation in terms of chess. And it's the same thing with climate change in this, in this instance, since I know an awful lot about climate change relative to the average person, but I'm not a climate scientist, but I know enough to recognize James Hansen's expertise. And I know enough to recognize William Happer's ignorance. And William Happer is the alpha denier in the United States. He was, he's a PhD physicist. He's a consultant or uh, lobbyist for the fossil fuel industry. And he was uh, Donald Trump's uh, chief energy czar. Or climate czar, and and his and his arguments are as ridiculous as something you would read in George Will or Tucker Carlson. It's very ignorant. And what Dunning and Kruger discovered in 1999, they published their, their research. They're both psychologists. Is that people who don't have no knowledge or no experience of a topic have the greatest confidence because they don't know enough to know what that that they don't know. And, and so to learn a little bit about something like, for example, climate physics, the most important thing you learn is not so much about the climate physics itself, but to learn how complicated it is and what it is you don't know. So you can tell the difference between a highly confident um, person who, who doesn't understand anything and, 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 a, and, a, and a person like James Hansen, who, who really does know what he's talking about. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, as, as systems engineer, uh, the universe is a system, uh, and, and, and it looks something like this spiral galaxy out here, and we're in the middle of the two arms uh, in our galaxy equivalent, and, uh, and, 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 and the solar system is a subsystem of the, of, the, of the galactic system, which is a subsystem of the universal system. The Earth system Subsystem is, 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 of course, a subsystem of the entire solar system. And, 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 con and human economy is a subsystem of the Earth system. So it, it has to obey all the same laws that, that are handed down through all these systems, which it's nested. And, and, and that's, a, that's problematic for, for uh, neoclassical economics. So the history of the universe, we can see as far back as the cosmic microwave background, which is about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. We can actually see this. Um, 
Uh, and then there's the dark ages. We'll talk about that later. And then the first galaxies and stars form about two to 300 million years after the cosmic microwave background. And then, then we have the modern universe today as it evolved and here 13.8 billion years later. Everything before this is speculative. Uh, stuff immediately before is, is, is we're fairly confident in our knowledge. Uh, and then when you get back towards inflation, it becomes more speculative. Inflation is part of the standard model of cosmology because it explains everything and it, and, and it works. So when we see all this stuff out here, uh, this works to explain it all. But there are, uh, there are uh, Nobel Prize winning physicists who actually question this part of it. And then there's the Big Bang and, and there's, we don't know what that is. Um, so the, this is the cosmic microwave background. And uh, it was predicted by Apper in 1948. And, and right around 1948, around that time, um, physicists uh, using, Mac, uh, using um, the general theory of relativity, Einstein's equation, evolved the idea, the concept of a Big Bang. And I don't even know if they had named it that in, in, by 1948, but anyway, a singularity um that w w where the universe must have had, a, had this kind of a beginning and and after uh said, made a prediction he said well if it's true and then you working the mathematics for it he said there would have to be this we'd have to be able to see a cosmic microwave background and um and, and in 1965 uh penzias and wilson actually discovered it it was consternation it, it was a good thing it proved that Apfer was right, and, and uh, Penzias and Wilson won the Nobel Prize for their discovery. But he, they measured, they had more or less a primitive radio telescope, and they measured 2.7 degrees everywhere as a constant, 2.72 degrees. That was the limit of their measuring device. That was good because it proved the, uh, the Big Bang, um, but it was also bad because if the, if the universe was exactly 2.7 degrees everywhere, nothing would have happened. The earth, the, the universe would have been stillborn. The, the hydrogen and, and helium uh, atoms that were formed in the Big Bang would have felt the same tug of gravity in every direction and they just would have gradually just moved apart and nothing would have ever happened. Fortunately, when we build better telescopes and, and better measuring devices, we were able to measure that the, 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 the red parts are colder and more dense, importantly more dense than the blue parts by one part in 10,000, a very tiny difference. But because of that difference, that meant that every little uh, atom of, of hydrogen and helium felt a, a differential tug toward the red areas and away from the blue areas. Which meant eventually, and it took a long time, like a, a 200 million to 300 million years, that was that dark age, before enough of them got together and, and, and gravity would, would accelerate their, 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 their compression into, into stars. And if that never happened, uh, we would never exist. And so um, the universe was born in, in a sense because, and, and, and evolved, and we became, to, to exist because of this differential gravi gravitational or gravitational energy potential difference. And of course, also the potential energy difference between hydrogen and, and, and the confused into, into, into larger um, 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 ions. So, uh, so that was a fortunate thing that, to discover that. And uh, so here's the cosmic microwave background. This is as far as we can actually see. Uh, what we what we know about the universe we, is is like on this yellow line, and so when our, our telescopes we look far in, into space, but we're also looking back in time because of the finite speed of light, and and so Abel, uh, uh, this is a galaxy, um, four and a half billion years ago. Uh, it, the, the light we receive from it today, it emitted four and a half billion years ago, which is about the approximate es estimate of, of the Earth, the age of the Earth. Today, it is much further than that because of the expansion of the universe, maybe five or six billion years. I don't know exactly. And, uh, and so it's moving away from us, but that's, that's the light we see from it. 
when we go, when we go all the way back here um, and, and see the Big Bang, well, that part of that what we see is now 45 billion light years away from us because of, again, the, the, ex, the, the ex acceleration expansion of the universe. And, but, but it, we assume that, that that piece of, of the universe looks exactly like, or roughly the same as, as our piece of the universe. You know, a couple of spot, big spiral galaxies maybe, and maybe some um, elliptical galaxies and so forth. And the same with Abel, you know, it's, its vicinity is probably similar to ours. Now, what's interesting is this is the limit of what we can see. We can't see beyond this. And so that raises the question, well, how big is the actual universe? The, the visible universe is only this big. Well, if you, there, this, is, this part of the universe is now exists. Uh, it looks similar to ours. There's probably a spiral galaxy around there, and there's probably, a, you know, planets with, with, with an intelligent life. And what they can see in their telescopes is they can see us only as we appeared in, in their view of the, uh, of the cosmic microwave background. And that's the limit of their universe. They can't see all this other stuff that we can see, but they can see a whole swatch of the universe beyond this that we can't see. And so we, we, we definitely believe that the universe is much bigger than what we can see. And there's, there's other evidence for that. For example, we can measure the flatness of the, of the universe. It's not, it's not changing as it gets closer to the edge there. Uh, so the best estimate is that it's at least a million times bigger than the visible universe in volume. And, and we'll revisit that later on, that number. So here's, here's some numbers. Time and, 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 uh, and distance are, are effectively equivalent. Mars is uh, 12 minutes away. Um, for example, the sun is eight minutes away. So <laughs> the, the sun could supernova. It could, might, might be right now supernova. And we wouldn't know for eight minutes that, <laughs> that we're already toast. And, and all, and Irindel is the oldest observed star so far. And it was just observed this, sh well, it might've been last year it was observed, but the publication was just a few weeks ago. Uh, it's 13 billion, it's light, 13 billion years is how old the light is that reaches us, and it's about estimated 28 billion light years away currently. Interestingly, it's not a first generation star. The first generation stars would only have hydrogen and helium in them, and that's because that's all that existed, and they would be huge, massive stars and would have only lasted a few million years and then exploded into supernovae and they would have spread their all the all that metals heavy metals and everything else that they created in the fusion process and then and then second and third generation stars would have formed out of that um that nebula that cloud and Arundel is at least the second or third generation star because it does have some metals um so these are universal laws uh, I, I put this caveat we think so far the, our universal laws are really bloody good because, and we know this because we have the internet, you're using the internet uh, and, um, and you have a toaster oven, <laughs> the Large Hadron Collider, you got an MRI per, perhaps, and, and, that, and that was really beneficial for your health. Um, uh, X-rays in case you broke a bone and so forth. And all that stuff is a consequence of, of the fact that our laws are bloody good. They, they, they have to be a really good approximation to, to what the, um, how the universe actually behaves, the actual universal laws. And I'll give an example for how good they must be. But we still have these unknowns. We don't know what dark matter is. We don't know what dark energy is and so forth. So, so there's an awful lot of stuff we don't know. And, and, and everything prior to the cosmic microwave background is just speculation. Good speculation, but but still, it, it, it would be nice to know a little better. Probably all these laws are true at scale, and then and then they and then if you if you get in, into different scales or, or, or something, there's there, there are approximations to a to a better law, like like Newton's law of gravity is true, but it's a, and it's approximation to the general theory of relativity when you make some simplifying assumptions. Let's take quantum electrodynamics. And by the way, dot, 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 this is not a complete list. Uh, electron magnetic dipole moment or Dirac's number. Our theory predicts it 
into this is a residual to, to to this level of I think that's ten significant digits. An experiment predicts it to, to, this is exactly the same. They agree. So that's amazing to me. So there's three amazing things. One is that we can actually compute it that that, that accurately. And it's um, it, the, the computation is very complex because it's a very slowly conversion um, infinite series. And so you have all these terms and you have to work through all of them because because they, they have significant weight and until you find they get small enough that you can start neglecting them. And uh, and it takes a supercomputer and it takes, you know, months to, to, to churn this out. But this is what they calculate. Uh, the experiment measures this, which is another remarkable thing that they can build an experiment with this level of fidelity. And then the third remarkable thing is that they agree. <laughs> so obviously our, um, our theories are really, really good. Okay. It's not just the fact that we have the internet. <laughs> Okay, the cosmological principle is an, is an assumption we make that the universe is isotropic and homogeneous at large scale. And what this means is we're making the assumption that we're that I mentioned before that a bell, that galaxy a bell is is in its vicinity looks pretty much like the vicinity of the Milky Way, and and also that that other bit that 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 uh, the cosm the, the cosmic microwave background that forty six. Uh, thousand or whatever it is light years away from us uh 46 billion light years away from us actually looks the same as more or less as our universe it all looks like this in other words um actually we don't know if that's true <laughs> but we're, we're pretty confident that it is the equivalence principle is uh another one i want to show you how good our our, our stuff is the in internal mass in inertial mass and gravitational mass of, the of a body are the same. And this is a, an assumption that Newton made, but he wasn't sure he was right. Um, he had this famous formula, F equals MA, and this defines inertial mass. So this, this is the mass of, if you think of a big, huge Buick and, uh, and, and, and it's broken down and you want to push it off to the side of the road, you need a bunch of people, you know, a 1977 Chevy Impala, you're not going to push it by yourself. And, uh, and because it weighs a lot, it, it's got a lot of mass. But if you take uh, a, a little car, like a smart car, you could do it all by your smell self, even while you're turning the steering wheel and just pushing on the on the uh, on the frame around the around the driver's seat. So that's inertial mass. Um, gravitational mass is defined by this equation, which is also in, in Newton's Principia, and that defines how how two bodies are 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 uh, are, are, are attracted to each other. And so that's, and, and, and that mass, that's how, how you're attracted to the mass of the earth <laughs> by this equation. And, and he assumed that these masses were the same. Uh, in 1971, Dave Scott kind of demonstrated that on the Apollo, Apollo 15 mission by dropping a feather and a hammer at the same time on the moon. Moon has no uh, atmosphere, and they both fell exactly the same and hit hit at the same time. Well, that's that's a demonstration, but it's not a, a, a exact a, a perfect per, perfectly good experiment. Uh, but it, but it's true. We did this, and um, when we um, today, more recently, we have um, uh, what's called the microscope satellite mission, and it was able to measure the equivalence of these two uh, masses within an accuracy of uh, one part in 10 to the 15. So, and, and that, that was limited by the, by the accuracy of the, of the, of the, of the, of the experiment, not by how, how close these guys really are to being, being the same. Uh, so they probably are identical. That, that's the assumption It's probably a good assumption. Uh, and now I want to talk about entropy. Entropy is not w well understood by by people, and it's a it's a difficult concept to grasp. I, I'm gonna I have my next view graph. I hope explains it a little bit. But entropy is time, and uh, entropy grows. And the fact that entropy is growing is is defining time. And uh, and so uh, at the, at the cosmic microwave background, it was something on the order of ten to the power eighty eight. Today, it's 10 to the power of 104, so 16 orders of magnitude greater. 
And uh, and at the end of the universe, maximum entropy for at least the visible universe is, is another 19 orders of magnitude. So we will have normal star formation uh, between one and a, and a, and a, and a a hundred trillion years. So, so it's a long, long time the, the universe will last. And, and, it, and it will evolve from a simple thing, the cosmic microwave background, just hydrogen and helium to something very complex. I mean, we have a lot of complexity, black holes, neutron stars, white dwarfs, all this stuff and, uh, and, and, and galaxies and, and plain old normal suns into something simple when, when there's, it's flat, the universe is flat again, there's no uh, potential energy differences to anywhere. The heat is exactly evenly distributed. Uh, there's, there's no gravitational energy uh, distinction and, it, and it's a flat and nothing can ever happen after that. So time ends because there's no energy to drive a, 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 an event. So we can ask ourselves, uh, a physicist would ask himself, why did the universe begin with low entropy? Which it did, and it's and it seems like a, a, a probabilistically a, a low probability, but we actually don't know. Um, a, a hunter gatherer laying in the in in a, in a in a in a field looking up at the sky, and they would be privileged to see a much much more beautiful sky than we could possibly see today because of all the light uh, pollution. Uh, and and they were more attuned in many ways to their their natural environment than we can possibly be, and they might lay there and ask why are we here, which is the question that a lot of us would, would ask today anyway, or why is there something rather than nothing? And so these are equivalent questions, in my view. Uh, so let's talk about what entropy is. Uh, if 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 you take a cup of hot tea. Uh, it's a, it's pro you boiled it, so it's approximately 100 degrees, maybe a little less. Uh, ambient air is about 20 degrees, depending on where you put your thermostat. And you can buy one of these Sterling engines uh, for about $35. I bought a couple for my grandchildren. They're really cool, and they actually work. Heat disperses. Heat flows from a hot reservoir to a cold, cold reservoir. And, and you'll have heat loss through the cup itself, and, and you'll have heat loss in this direction. Um, and, 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 and the heat traveling through this direction, the, the uh, Stirling engine takes advantage and moves. So this thing will rotate. And, and of course there are friction losses. Um, you know, the, the bearings are only uh, so good and so forth. And that turns into heat too. And, and so what happens is instead of having an energy gradient of hundred degrees here and 20 degrees here, ultimately this will cool down to the same as the room temperature. And when that happens, no more heat can flow and this Stirling engine will stop. And so what we say is free energy is lost and entropy is created. And so the universe began with a state of low entropy is equivalent to saying it began with a state of high free energy, potential energy, or a large energy gradient for, in order for energy to flow. And energy has to flow. Uh, we tend to think of energy as a commodity, but it, it, it's really the flow of energy that, that drives processes and not, not, the, not the actual energy itself. And, and no energy is lost, by the way, because all the energy in here is just spread out. And that's the that's definition of, of entropy. You can't use it anymore. Um, so thermodynamics, it's not just a good idea. It's the law. Carl Pilcher said that in, in this video. To do any work requires a flow of energy. So in the production function in economics, the only factor of production is, a, is energy flow. And, 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 um, and labor and capital are, are merely feedback phenomena. So if, the, if you can flow energy, you can grow more people because you can feed more people. And, and as long as they can eat, they can, they can do work. Or, 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 or a lathe can turn if you plug it into a wall outlet. You can't make the lathe without energy to begin with. So it's a feedback phenomenon. But the, but the fundamental source of, of production is, is, is a flow of energy. And, and, and he, he, neoclassical and neoliberal economists don't understand this. And so we know, I know from physics, looking at, at these two disciplines, that they're wrong. I don't need you know, Joe Stiglitz and, and Steve Keen and, and Yanis Varoufakis to tell me that they're wrong. 
they tell me that they're wrong for a lot of other reasons. Okay, so to flow energy requires dissipation of an energy gradient. So we had to have that energy gradient, the 100 degrees and the 20 degrees. Um, and dissipating an energy gradient burns exergy, that, throwing out another word for you, free energy, and that produces entropy. And there are multiple definitions of entropy, which you may be familiar with, irreversibility. So you drop an egg and it splatters all over the floor. Um, that's, uh, that, that, that process is irreversible. And also related to time, because if you, if you see a video of an egg falling on the floor and splattering, you know it's running in the right direction. If you, if you show the, the video backwards, where, where all these bits of egg are, are accumulating and reforming a shell and it's popping back up onto the counter, you, you know implicitly that that's running backwards. That, that's, that's a reversal of time because you're, you're, you're doing a, performing a process that's irreversible. That's, that's the core, you know, Carnot and Clausius, that's uh, uh, basic thermodynamics. Uh, and then, as I said, dissipation of potential energy gradients or loss of free energy uh, disorder. Uh, this is due to Boltzmann. And you probably heard this definition, and, and that's the, the heart of statistical mechanics. The amount of information necessary to characterize a system due to Claude Shannon. And that's the heart of information theory. And that's important for my students, most of whom will be uh, electrical engineers or uh, computer engineers or uh, communications engineers, and, and well, they'll go into information technologies. So this is the core uh, un underpinning of, of, uh, of information theory. Uh, and then time, as I talked about, and underneath it all is entanglement or quantum entropy, and, and that's due to von Neumann. And uh, if you're interested in that, because I'm, I'm not competent enough to explain that, you can, you can look at this video down here. Now, Arthur Eddington uh, in 1927 during the Gifford le lectures wrote, uh, the law that entropy always increases, the second law of thermodynamics holds, I think the supreme position among the laws of nature. If your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There is nothing for it but the collapse and deepest humiliation. And again, this is the heart of my criticism of neoliberal and neoclassical economics. Uh, the economist uh, Nicholas Sturgess Grogan wrote a huge book on in, in the 60s, I believe, or maybe it was the 70s, on this very point that, that economists are neglecting uh, entropy and thermodynamics. So it's an economist that, that, that is informing us of this, but as physicists, we can, we can understand that that's true. Uh, this is interesting st stuff that may not explain anything at all. It's products of our imagination. It's creation tales. And trying to answer that very question that, that I posed before, why are we here? And so a lot of this is physics. These are, these are a bunch. This is probably not a, 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 um, it's a, an exhaustive list. Uh, the multi, you've probably heard of these things. Multiverse, many worlds hypothesis, hypo hypothesis. You might not have heard of quantum Bayesianism, big banks or big bounce or cyclic cosmology. You might have heard of this is um, Roger Penrose's um, uh, pet theory, inflation theory, which is part of the, which Penrose doesn't like, is part of the uh, standard model of cosmology, uh, and, and and on and on, and and uh, including we are living in a simulation. I find it. I find some of these useless, like this one and these two, but. You know, who am I? I? I can't explain any of them. And then this includes metaphysics. And so if you remember that our hunter gatherer laying in the field and, uh, and, and trying to figure out everything and, and he's inventing uh, a, a creation story um, with, with the buffalo god or elks or whatever it is that he's, so it's religion and spirituality and philosophy too. Now, I can't disprove any of this stuff and I don't even wish to, but my point is, as an engineer, none, I, none of this is useful to me. As opposed to that other list I gave you, uh, like the general theory of relativity, I've used that in, 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 in designing satellite communication systems. I've had to use the special theory of relativity, quantum physics. All that stuff is useful. It's not only we know it to be very close, good approximation to reality, but it's also useful. None of this stuff is actually useful. We can't do anything with any of this stuff. 
in terms of, of engineering, or at least not yet, <laughs> that's for sure. So where did our elements come from? So uh, I, I mentioned a couple of times that the Big Bang only produced hydrogen, helium, and just a smattering of lithium. Everything else uh, was generated in, in these highly um, energetic events, uh, exploding massive stars, uh, merging neutron stars, and, and so forth. And, uh, and we'll see why in a minute. Um, uh, and, and so we needed multiple generations of, of stars before we could have things like humans and cockroaches and rocks. Uh, so moving on, um, this, this begins to explain it. So these are all the elements. It's a, it's a different way to look at the periodic table of elements. And this is a map of, of the energy that it, that it, that it, the, the binding energy of, 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 a of a, uh, of a, um, a, 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 a nucleus of a molecule, of an atom rather. And so iron, copper, cobalt, nickel, all the ones up here in this little flat area are basically the most stable elements. Iron is, is particularly stable. And, it, and, it, and, and, and it's a size nucleus that binds the most tightly and requires the least energy to, to bind it. And so as you go away from that, you, you, need, to, you need to apply energy. Uh, to, to create, for example, uranium and, 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 um, and, uh, and, and so forth. And so when we, we start with hyd uh, hydrogen, we see an atomic mass of one proton, a hydrogen atom, a single atom is 1.0079. So it's slightly greater than one of, of these units. As it, as it forms helium and, uh, and all the way up to iron, you see an iron uh, mass is uh, it, the, the atomic number is 56, 57, and 58, but the average mass of iron is 55.8. It's less than than the, the numbers of the um, of the protons that 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 formed it in the first place. Because you should take 56 of these protons, you should have a number greater than 56, and instead you have 55.8. And this is what fuels. This is the fuel for the stars because in, in going in this direction, you release energy. And even though it's a tiny amount, uh, it's, it, 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 this is Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared. M can be small, but speed of light, that's the speed of light, and you're squaring it. It's a huge number squared. So there's an, an awful amount, of, a large, huge amount of energy that's released by this reaction. That's what we're trying to do on Earth today by creating fusion. And we're, we're having mixed results. We already can do this. So, so in order to go from, from these um, metals all the way out here to uranium and these other guys, you need, you need energy to create them. And that's why you need uh, neutron stars exploding and all this, these massive energetic events. Uh, and, and some of that energy is used to, 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 to bind these guys together to form these bigger, um, bigger atoms. Now, Today, we can take the advantage of that since we have uranium-235 and 238, and, uh, and, um, and we can go back in this direction. And that's, that's where we get our, 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 our fission energy from. Well, we'll talk more about this in, in, in part five when we talk about actually our, our energy uh, sources. Uh, a small stars, uh, they don't have enough, enough um, mass they have a little bit of mass, but not enough. They, they only have enough to, 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 to burn hydrogen into helium because of the temperature required. Uh, so so, so, so the, the, the mass of the star determines the gravity, which can compress it, heat it up, and, um, and you get these forces. And, and you can burn hydrogen into helium in a, in a small star. Something that's even smaller than a star like Jupiter or, or Saturn are mostly hydrogen, but they're not, they don't have enough uh, mass to generate the heat in their core to actually get fusion going. Uh, uh, the, our sun will be, will be smart, will be large enough to, to not only burn hydrogen, but eventually burn helium. And it'll burn helium into, into carbon and oxygen. And it's doing a little bit of that today. But you need the really massive stars to start burning all the way down to, to elements near iron. And the first stars 
they only last a short, even though they had this massive amount of fuel, they're so hot, they burn through it really fast. So in a few million years, they're, 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 they, 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 it's all they live and then they explode into supernova. And that's where we create all these heavy elements like iron and nickel and copper and stuff like that. So, uh, so, so that was the first generation stars and multiple generations of stars. So our sun is estimated that the, the, what I read is, is there's 40 generations of, 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 of uh, star of star formations before we got to the sun. And we had to have the stars form and, and uh, supernova and other stars form out of their, their debris and supernova and so forth until we got to the sun, which formed out of what was uh, a, 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 a solar nebula um, associated with, 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 with so many explosions. Okay, we, we could do some fun stuff now. Uh, well, I think it's all fun. Fermi Paradox was named after Enrico Fermi. Uh, and and, and, and the, he asked the question, are we alone in the universe? That it's only us and there's no other intelligent life. Or maybe there's plenty of intelligent life, but we're just isolated from it. And uh, the Drake's equation was about a, a famous equation going, going back to the 1960s. He asked the question about isolation, what, uh, and, which Enrico Fermi did when he asked, where is everybody? I mean, why aren't we in contact with these uh, if there's so many other uh, extraterrestrial um, aliens? Why, why, haven't we, why haven't they discovered us or we discovered them? And, uh, and that's an open debate. All these Fs are, are probabilities and, and we don't have to get into that because we can ask the question, well, are we alone? And so rather than if we're just if we're isolated. And so what we really need to know is there's an estimated 300 uh, million habitable planets in the Milky Way galaxy. And, and that's, it's prob there's probably more than that now. There's probably have a better, as they discover uh, more and more exoplanets, they get a better feel for it and they keep bumping up that number. There's an estimated uh, 2 billion galaxies in the visible universe. And then, as I said before, the whole universe is about a million times larger than the visible universe. And you multiply all those numbers together, you get that there are potentially 600 million, 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 if I added the right number of millions, planets in the universe, which might have one time hosted life. And then, of course, they're their, their sun supernova or whatever. They might be, they might help be hosting life right now, or they might someday host life. And, and in other words, they're the, the star and they're in the, in the, in the beginning stages of, of, uh, of, of, of star and planetary uh, formation, or maybe they're in the middle of the, their version of the dinosaurs existing and they haven't yet gotten to intelligent life, uh, but they may someday get there. And Carl Sagan quipped that the universe is a pretty big place. So if it's just us, it seems like an awful waste of space. And so there's so many opportunities. And, and that number, as I said, is probably growing as they as they as we learn more about habitable planets. Um, uh, in, in this paper, not too long ago, about a year and a half ago, they estimate that there's at least 36 currently communicating alien civilizations However, the nearest one may be 7,000 to 70,000 light years away. So the good news is, well, we're not alone, but we are pretty isolated. Because if you think about when we start our, our radio programming and uh, our, our I Love Lucy's and, and uh, Life of Riley's being transmitted out into space, it's, it's going to be 7,000 years before these, guys, the, these aliens hear them and say, hey, there's an, there's intelligent life over here. Let's let's send them a message back. Well, we won't get that for another seven thousand years. <laughs> so we have to kind of stay alive to 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 find out. Uh, so so my thinking about all this is 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 um, is we're not alone. There's just too many opportunity, and I agree with Carl Sagan. But we're probably isolated because the universe is so bloody big and the distances are so vast. That that uh, it it's it's contact is 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 probably highly unlikely. That's just an opinion, and and you're welcome to have some other opinion. And and maybe there are wormholes and stuff that that, that we uh, as yet knows unknown unknown things that we might discover so we can travel there. Here's a uh, uh, and this is the. Uh, 
uh, main sequence of stars. And, uh, and, and our sun is not a particularly uh, unique star. It's, it's, it's right in the middle of the main sequence. It's, it's in terms of temperature and luminosity. Uh, so there's nothing special about it. And there's plenty of stars that are equivalent to our sun, which is, it, it's actually called a G star. And, uh, and it might not be the most ideal star for hosting life. I mean, we only have one example. Uh, we don't know, but um, I'll show you a, 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 in comparison to, a, to a, a, one of these cooler stars, a K star, that, 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 that might even be better. I mean, I'm making a guess here. So if we look at the main sequence of stars and all the data, we see that a G star uh, lasts for 10 billion years. And our sun is, is already four and a half billion years into its 10 billion year life. Uh, uh, these are uh, K stars uh, will last five times longer and M stars will last uh, perhaps 20 times longer because they're, they're much smaller uh, and they burn much more slowly. Because, again, because gravity is, is, is not as, 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 as efficient as, as pushing them together. And so they'll burn or, or, or fuel more slowly. So, the, so this blue area is the habitable zone where liquid mortar might exist. And, and this, the sun is privileged to have three planets that are in the habitable zone, the potential for liquid water. Um, and the earth is, is right in the middle of that. Um, so Venus and, and, and Mars may never have had liquid water or they may have had it and lost it for, for, for some reason. And, and there's a lot of good ideas kicking around about why that might have happened. But suffice to say, at least we, we, we have complex life. Galice also has uh, three planets in its habitable zone and in particular G, which is smack in the middle. And, and Galice G, is just a little bigger than the Earth. It's not much different than the Earth. And, uh, and, and the, the, the great thing about Galicia is it's going to last five or 10 times longer than the sun. And so after four and a half billion years, it's got plenty of life left in it, in, 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 the, in the star. And uh, so there's plenty of opportunity for, for uh, intelligent life to form. And in fact, it can do it over and over and over again. Uh, uh, so before until it gets it right, and uh, and so this this might be a better place, and that's what that one paper uh, was about that I, I showed the reference to. Um, oh, here it is. This is the paper right here. So Goldilocks galore, hundreds of millions of Milky Way, and these are talking about all those uh, K and M stars that that they believe now can host be host for life. And here's the. Uh, the, uh, the, the technical paper, it's May 2023. So it's just the, this year. I'm trying to keep this, these talks updated as, as, as I can with the most recent uh, stuff. We're looking for life within our own uh, solar system in, in these places, two, two, well, one planet, one uh, X planet and a bunch of, um, you know, here's a large asteroid and a bunch of uh, moons. We don't expect that, this is why we think there might have life. We don't expect there to be intelligent life or even complex life, but, but, but possibly uh, maybe even just viral life or, or something like that, you know? Um, uh, so we'll see. And, uh, and if you're a Pluto lover, it may yet be a planet. It's still a controversy. Um, and so summary, and so we're at the end. Um, we only know the approximate laws to the laws of nature. And we know that. But they're pretty good. It's a pretty damn good approximation because uh, right here we, we're having this this uh, conversation over the internet. Uh, the laws we do now apply to the entire universe, and conversely, whatever the universe's laws really are, and, I, and it's probably a superset of of the laws we've discovered. Uh, it, it, so our laws might all be accurate, but but yet there's there's a superset above that. Those laws apply to us, even though we don't know what they are. Uh, and the universe had to play out over some time, billions of years, to be able to host life. Uh, be, because I, I talked about it, it's only hydrogen and helium, and you had to go through, at least to get to the sun, 40 different uh, uh, supernovas or, or, or generations of stars. And even that uh, er, 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 or whatever it was called, it had, a, had, a, had a, at least a couple of generations before it because it just had trace elements of uh, 
of, of carbon and, and oxygen and so forth. And, and we'll see in the next episode that solar system and the earth had to play out over billions of years to be able to host complex life. And, and we'll go through that in detail. Uh, we are unique, but not special is another way of saying, I think we're, we're isolated and, and this is us, we're, 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 we're relatively important uh, to this part of the, the universe, small part, but we're not special. <laughs> we're, not a, we're not alone. There's pro almost certainly plenty of other life out there, at least that's my opinion. Uh, the universe works to maximize entropy and dissipate energy gradients. And energy conversion, entropy production determine everything that happens in the universe. And then, of course, this is from David Caitling. It's a curious byproduct of ever increasing entropy in the universe that ordered low entropy st structures such as organisms spring into existence. And this is, seems like a contradiction, but but I think scientists have, uh, have agreed that, that that is indeed true. And now on to the birth of the solar system. And um, by the way, before we go there, there are limits, <laughs> speed of light. And, and important for us, there are limits to growth on a finite planet. Uh, the, referring back to Meadows and Meadows, Randers, and Burns book in 1972, Limits to Growth. Now, 51 years ago. And, uh, and that's yet another reason thing that, that, that economists kind of get wrong. They never understood the brilliance of that book and they never accommodated or adopted it into their thinking. And so that's, not, that's it. We're done. And next week will be, or next time we get together, will be the evolution of Earth.